Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 13th episode of the European Volleyball Show, where we talk about everything going on in European volleyball, which recently has been dominated by one big thing. The Champions League and the Super Finals happened in Verona last weekend. Very exciting matches, and we will for sure get to that. But first, joined by, as always, Rob St. Clair. Hey, Dan. Uh, welcome back to the office. You had a big week last week. Yes, it was great. I actually got to be on site in Verona, which was fantastic and, and really lucky to be there and see the extremely high level of volleyball being played. But Rob, Rob, how was your week? I was watching uh, watching on, on Facebook, I believe it was, right? It was great. We had a, a couple people over here in Chicago in the USA who wanted to watch the matches. Um, it was awesome. It was great getting to kind of watch it with other people and make an event out of it, uh, which is obviously what the matches deserved. They <laughs> delivered. And of course, we'll get to that. But big congratulations to you, Dan, and the CEV for the incredible event that you guys pulled off with all all things considered. Uh, I, I look to me like it went incredibly well. Yes, I, I think it all went very smoothly. I think the uh, yeah, from what I've heard, it looked great on TV. So glad that everything worked out. And, and most of all, happy that we had two incredible volleyball matches because those are one for the ages uh but first i think we have to go over a couple of the other events going on uh the first one happening i mean both these two next events we're going to talk about are happening right now the uh, continental cup phase two on the beach happening uh right now and if you guys don't aren't familiar with this tournament it is basically to qualify uh one team per continent for the olympic games happening later on this summer so each of the five federation, confederations will have an, the opportunity to send one additional team to the Olympics, specifically from their confederation and the European one happening right now. We are in phase two. This is not the final phase. There's so still one more to go, but it's happening right now. You can catch the live streams on Facebook, or sorry, on YouTube, uh, the YouTube channel that you're watching <laughs> right now. So easy to, if, you wanna, if you need to switch or watch both at the same time, why not? Um, but the format is interesting, Rob, because it is basically you're playing more as a country rather than necessarily as an individual team. So you're playing uh, with another pair of players from your country. And when you win the tournament, you're not qualifying your team specifically. You're qualifying an additional spot for your country. For your country. Yeah, I was I was seeing that when I was like just hearing a couple headlines the other day. and. This is not a competition that was on my radar, particularly to be honest with you guys. But there wasn't there some drama on the men's side about Norway because our like classic beach volley Vikings that dominate Europe and the world consistently um, had to withdraw from competition. Is that correct? And that kind of shook up everything. Well, basically, they can't play in the tournaments because they they won the world champion or they they've already qualified. Sorry for for the olympics basically. for the olympics okay so it's the same thing as a lot of the indoor ones where if you've already qualified you can't you can't play in it yes but technically if they could have played then they could have got additional points for norway to help another team qualify right got it okay interesting yeah. um yeah so that's going on on youtube right now so if you are interested in beach volleyball missing some beach volleyball um you can go check that out I'm just trying to find a list of the players that have already qualified to the Olympics because there's a, there's a there's a quite a big list actually. So we have uh, Krauchnoka Gradina, the two the two Latvian girls, uh, Plavin Stocks, Danieli Lupo, and Paula Nikolai are all qualified to the Olympics already. So they will not be participating in this. And yeah, highly recommend you guys go check that out because there's still a ton of good players left. Oh yeah, yeah, and those matches, anything with Olympic berths on the line, even if it's not directly for the pairs, uh, you know that the stakes are gonna be high. For sure. All right, now let's go on to the other tournaments taking place. It's, we end Super Finals and go right into to more volleyball, Rob. The uh, Euro Volley Qualifiers. Do you wanna go talk about the men or the women first? Because, and by the way, these are also starting like right now. They're going on live as we speak. Tons of right. games over uh, the next two weeks. 
I have the men's pulled up right now. So just to be convenient, let, oh, let's tackle that. I'm I'm not sure. I, this is like kind of the first time I followed this stage of the Eurovolley tournament. Can you explain the format to me a little bit? Because I'm seeing like seven pools with some yeah. sort of weird numbers. Who advances and how do you, how do they grab those those spots in Eurovolley? So basically, the four hosts qualify automatically. The right. um, sorry, the the there's twelve teams that qualify basically based on their rankings uh, in the world in the European rankings, and then the rest of the spots are up for grabs by um, the rest of the teams. So and how many spots is that total? So basically, if you come first place in your pool for the men, that's seven teams. If for, so seven spots plus the five second place spots, best second place spots as well for the men. Women, there's six pools, so it's six and six, so top two teams from each pool. Got it. So, I mean, it's, it's fairly generous. Uh, you, can, you can definitely uh, qu- still be able to qualify if you lose a couple matches, but getting in is one of those second place teams. You're, you're playing with fire there a bit. Right, and it's kind of like Champions League, really, like in the fourth round, having to be one of the best second place teams to make it to the quarterfinals. It's a, a, a similar deal where finishing second isn't necessarily good enough. Yeah. And so let's, uh, I'll just talk about a couple of the ones that look interesting to me, because on the men, we've already had a few of the pools happen. So we already have a few teams qualified, like Turkey and Bulgaria. No, no real surprises there. I guess the big surprise was Latvia was the first team to qualify through this format. So it's the first time they've been to Eurovol in a while and have a couple interesting players. But Rob, to me, the most interesting pool here, I think, is Croatia and the Netherlands playing together. Yes, that is that is a spicy pool, to say the least, especially because there's only three teams, Croatia, Netherlands, and Sweden. So each team will only play two matches. So margin of error, very slim there. And making it out as a second-place team in a three-team pool is actually much more difficult, unless they play each other twice. Is that what's happening there? Well, basically, the entire thing is is every tournament is, is a double round robin, so they will play twice. Ah. Okay, yeah. so they'll play four matches, but even still, like the, if you play less matches, you have to win more of them to to get that same percentage. To, um, like if if you go three and one, three and one's better than four and two, and to compare the three team pools to the four team pools, that's going to be really interesting, especially like Croatia and the Netherlands in particular, uh, both teams that I would expect to qualify for Eurovolley. Yeah, um, exactly. But no guarantee by any means that both of them will come out of this pool. That's going to be very interesting. Yeah, Especially and- if they beat up on one another, like if they <laughs> both go, I don't know, two and two, or if one goes three and one and one goes one and three, then they might be toast. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I, I think Croatia has a couple players here. I mean, we saw Marko Sedlicek kind of uh, have a pretty big season uh, there in Mons. And then I, I believe he moved to, was it China or Turkey for the rest of the season? But he's certainly a player that's going to be a big factor that wasn't before maybe. Um, they also have Timofey Zukowski doing very well playing in the Russian league this year. So Croatia, maybe maybe a team that's not talked about as much, but they can definitely stay competitive. Of course, we know Netherlands now playing in Nations League. I think you guys already know most of the big names on that one with uh, Namir and Teister Horst, um, Fabian Plak, Felter Termat, Heis von Solkema probably setting for them. So that's my team to watch for the men. Do you have another one, Rob, you want to talk about? Uh, I want to talk about North Macedonia finishing five and one in their pool with Turkey. Uh, so Turkey, yeah. Turkey qualifies automatically by winning the pool on tiebreakers, but there's a very, very good chance. Actually, it's pretty much guaranteed that <laughs> I think, five I think it one, is guaranteed. I think yeah, it is five guaranteed. Five and one going to be good enough as one of the second place teams to qualify. And then uh, Spain in pool D and Latvia's pool also finishing in the tiebreaker at four and two. A decent chance that they make it out of there as a second place team as yeah. well. All right, so guys, check that out. Stream on YouTube, but of course, Eurovolley TV, as always. If, if you want to watch all these matches, they are all there. So check that out. And for the woman, Rob, a um, bit of a different format, I guess, with only the six pools. So nice, even numbers, uh, which we always like to see. Um, yeah, but I, th- I think one of the teams that's, that's more interesting to me, I think, uh, already here is that Slovenia losing to Bosnia. Um, already in pool wow. F. Wow, I yeah. did not know that. So the Slovenian women seem usually usually a little bit stronger. So they are going to need to bounce back probably tonight against Latvia because I mean one loss isn't the worst, but three nothing could hurt them potentially 
And then I also think for me, probably uh, pool either C or E are the most interesting. Pool C with both Spain and Greece, two fairly strong teams, and also pool E with France, which it's always surprises me that France isn't, isn't nearly as strong in the women's as, as, as in the men's because their domestic league is, is fairly good. Yeah, I agree. They, I, I still expect them to get out and qualify for Eurovolley, especially because it's a, it's a little more generous in this one than the men's side because you, if you get second, you're guaranteed to make it out. Um, but like you said, one upset and that might be enough, yeah. might be enough to keep you out. So yeah, Slovenia needs a bounce back. Uh, France needs to play at a pretty high level. Um, again, like for qualifying spots in the tournament with the prestige of Eurovolley, the, the stakes of these matches are going to be very high. Yeah, and I mean, one of my favorite moments that we'll be seeing over the next few weeks is like when, when the teams qualify, it's such an emotional moment, especially, deal. Yeah. especially for the smaller countries that maybe are not necessarily contenders at Eurovolley, where this, you know, this is the opportunity for them to compete at the highest level, compete on the biggest stage and really represent their country. And, and I think it's a really kind of emotional moment and opportunity for them. Yeah, any qualification spot to a tournament like that, like Eurovolley, like Olympics, like even world championships uh, for a national team, it just means that much more because country pride, nationalism is, is really on the line, a big part of it. That means a lot to the teams that get to play in those tournaments. For sure. And Rob, I think it's, uh, I think it's time to go over the uh, Super Finals recap because I think it was you know pretty interesting games, obviously very good. And, um, you know, there's, I think there's a lot to go over because did they go, did they go how you expected? So let's start with the women's and Canaglian of Vakif Bank went pretty much exactly like I expected uh, in just an absolute like slug fest in, in five very intense close sets, like no game, no, no set wider than a three point margin of victory. Like that's really exactly what I maybe not expected, but at least was hoping for from those two teams. And it absolutely delivered. Like you were there, Dan, but watching watching from afar, I was just blown away at the level. We've been hyping it up for so many months. We've been wanting to see this one matchup between Vaca Bank and Canigliano for so many months. Oh, I know. We've, <laughs> we've talked about how hot they've both been coming in, how dominant they've been domestically and throughout the rest of Europe. And finally, we got to see him play and it definitely lives up, lived up to all possible expectations, in my opinion. Um, so I've got the stats in front of me here. A couple, the first, the first thing we absolutely have to talk about is the performance of Paola Egonu. Oh my like, goodness. wow. <laughs> 41 points in five yeah. sets. Like one of the most astronomical numbers you could ever imagine in a match with these stakes. Uh, 71 attacking attempts. Uh, 39 kills, blocked twice, six errors, 55% kill rate. Uh, I wish I could do the math that quickly on efficiency, but on that volume of attempts to score that many points is is a performance befit that befits the best player in the world. Uh, also had an ace and two blocks, so a well-deserved MVP award for Paolo Gondu. And even though the fi- the like the final point, the championship winning point belonged to Iganu. It was a little anticlimactic and like a micro touch challenge off the fingertips. Um, whatever. A point to point. Canegliano takes the win there. 64th win in a row. And the biggest of them all. Like, come on. It, it really just a storybook season for two absolute European giants. And it it delivered. It absolutely delivered. It was everything we wanted it to be. Um, and I'm excited to get into it a little further because there was a lot going on there. And I think we actually did a very good job previewing it and how the match kind of ended up playing out. Yeah, for sure. I, th- I think a lot of the things that, that we were talking about before were impacting the match, especially, like you said, Iganu versus Hawk. I think, like we discussed before, uh, if, if Vakif Bank could have slowed down Iganu just even a little bit, then, you know, this game maybe would have turned out differently, especially in the fifth set. But right. Caneliano, completely confident in Iganu's ability, even though they, they knew um, Canale, even though they knew Vakif Bank would probably game plan against Iganu, and they, and they did try to, um, you know, it still wasn't really enough. She still was finding a lot of empty court. She was still scoring fairly easily, fa- fairly efficiently. And you see that efficiency gap between um, Hawk and Iganu. And Hawk played a great game. She was relied on for a lot especially uh, with probably playing a little more out of system maybe 
than Caneliano right. was. Hawk had even more attempts than Agano did, which is astronomically but, high. I 78 mean, this, attacking attempts. This this whole thing about opposites just uh, on both these teams just completely uh, dominating the number of uh, sets for their or the usage uh, for their team is is something very interesting. And it was funny because we, we saw very little of that from the men, or at least definitely from Zaxa. But uh, I mean, Aganu was called on to do a lot, and she delivered. And the rest of the team right. delivered what they had to do, which is you know play solid defense, keep the ball alive, recycle everything. And I mean, that led to some lower efficiency numbers for everyone else. But I think, Rob, maybe with the first thing we can talk about is is the one uh, matchup where I, I thought Vakif Bank would, would have the advantage for sure was in the middle. And I don't think that really ended up being the case at all. Not really, which was very interesting. So first of all, we were wondering last week about which, like who the second middle would be for Canegliano. Um, like we knew Robin de Croyf would probably start, but we didn't know if it was going to be Rafael Foley or Sarah Farr. Um, they did go with the, like the more veteran presence of Rafaela Foley, and she played phenomenally well, I thought. Um, I, I thought she took up a great amount of space. She really got involved in the offense at key times. And again, like you said, against like Milena Rasic and Zahra Gunesh, we thought that Vakit Bank would want to run a lot of the offense through that spot. And just looking at their numbers, Rasic 20% kill rate and actually 0% efficiency. Um, two kills, two errors on yeah. 10 attempts. That is not not even close to what they wanted out of her. And then Gunesh, uh, let's see, nine kills on 19 attempts with six, no, five errors. That's not very good efficiency either. I was very surprised by that. Um, part of it was probably the the offensive opportunities that Vakit Bank was getting weren't perfect. Uh, we knew that that serving and passing was going to be a massive story, especially as, like in particular, Conegliano serving and Vakit Bank's reception. Um, there's a reason why they had to give Hawks so many balls. It's because they weren't perfectly in system all that much throughout the match. Uh, we know Maya Onyanovic is good enough to force middle in, in not quite perfect situations. But yeah, I was definitely surprised, like you, Dan, to see the two middle attackers' efficiencies that low for Vakit Bank. Yeah, and, and, and the issue is, too, they came at bad moments. They came at the right, end of sets. They right. came, especially, uh, there were a couple ones by Zara Gunesh in that, in that fifth set where you, you would have thought it would have been a fairly comfortable time to go middle. And, you know, she missed uh, out wide or, uh, you know, missed uh, just missed hands. And, and that can be a really big momentum killer when you have a middle who's been hitting 75% or whatever it is during the season. And to have her miss, you know, pretty key opportunities. And, you know, she's she's a lot younger, so maybe we can expect that of her. But uh, yeah, Milena Rasic, I, I definitely would have expected to uh, to have a few more points there. Yeah, the things that aren't captured on the stat sheet are the the times and the moments in which certain plays occur. Whether it's like a ridiculous Iganu like bomb out of system in a point when they were statistically lose or uh, Isabel Hawk did some things out of system that absolutely blew me away. Uh, there was, there was one play. That I can't remember when fourth set, maybe that she got a ball that Maya had to run down basically yeah. by, by the, the, the pole where the down official was standing like a crazy out of system platform set. And she like hammered it down the line and scored in a situation where she probably wasn't expected to. So those things are what really turn a match around when when you're in a situation where you're likely to score the point and you don't, or the other way around when you're not likely to score a point and you do. Those are those are the make or break points in a match. And I think set five, Vakit Bank started up four to nothing, at least three to nothing. Uh, they started out hot and quickly, and Canegliano absolutely roared back. Ended up winning 15-12. So th those moments that Canegliano was able to score on serve. Uh, in in a decent part, were due to Vakif Banks just making a couple mistakes at exactly the wrong times. I think he nailed it. And especially yeah, at the beginning of that fifth set, which is too bad because it was shaping up both, uh, going back and forth so much. And then when the fifth set, I think it started 4 nothing. that can be a little uh, of a buzzkill, I would say. And yeah, take the wind out of the sails for Vakif Bank, which I think you saw it, especially with some of the younger players who who hadn't necessarily been in this situation before. And then you you know you're battling for your life, and then you have this like not insurmountable gap to start the fifth set, but a pretty significant one, which I think caused them to maybe take a few risks, get in their own head, and it looked like they were they were about to make a comeback there. But of course, you said it did. The touch <laughs> it looked like that. 
especially like when I when Conigliano had to side out of rotation one to win the match, I thought that there was very serious comeback potential. That was the one place throughout the match that they struggled to get out of in reception when Igonu has to hit in position four on the left side. And yeah, had it not been for that micro touch, she also missed the end line by millimeters yes. too. Like that, that was a really good swing. Um, that that was the rotation throughout the match, and this is so common across so many teams in men's and women's that they struggled to get out of that rotation. When Vakipek was able to string some points together, when Igonu was trying to hit on the left side, getting a lot of balls, so it didn't look like either Kim Hill or Mackenzie Adams or Miriam Stilla was very comfortable hitting on the right. Oftentimes, they didn't pass well enough in that rotation to run the middle. So it was pretty much Volosh to Egonu on the left, very predictably in that rotation. And that one crucial one, of course, Egonu got the got the micro touch. Uh, but I, I definitely saw the the potential for the Vaca Bank comeback in that moment. Yes, for sure. Uh, Carlos Sant- Santini's, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, usual guest of the show. Um, Canelia specializes in comebacks. Same thing happened at the finals of the Scudetto and Italian Cup. Yeah, fair enough. They're a very, they're a very poised team, which I, I think showed in this match. They, uh, they don't get rattled easily, and I think that's, you know, that's what Vacuum Bank needed. But I think Vacuum Bank did look a little, a little bit rattled towards the end. Uh, a few more things I want to talk about. One, the substitutions uh, for Canelianos, Mackenzie Adams for Sila, pretty, pretty early on in the second set there, and then also bringing out Rafaela Foley for Sarah Farr, which we. Uh, I think I definitely said I would start far, but Rob, I forget which one you, which direction you leaned, but Foley definitely seemed to be the right play there. Yeah, she played great. And I, I would give the X factor title of this match to Mackenzie yeah. Adams. There okay. was something about the Canegliano offense in set one and the early part of set two that to position four to both outside hitters in the front row just didn't look right. I, I don't know why, but the connection between Volosh and Hill and between Volosh and Sila just didn't quite look right in set one. Um, Kim Hill was the, the timing and the spacing of a normally very like well-oiled machine sort of offense just wasn't quite like clicking based on the eye test. And for some reason, when McKinsey Adams came in, um, that those those issues just kind of went away. Mm-hmm. Uh, she definitely she definitely held her own in service reception. Let me see the numbers. Yeah, she, a 52% positive, 45% perfect for Mackenzie Adams is a phenomenal passing output. Absolutely incredible on 29 attempts. That, that's fantastic. Yeah, you can see. I mean, then, Mackenzie Adams, good passer, but, but, but usually not the best. And you can see that Vacuum Bank was, right. trying, was trying to go at her, uh, much the same that Canaliano went at Michelle Barge. But yeah, like you said, she held it down. Didn't try to do too much, which, which I liked. I mean, you see the 9 for 25, which, okay doesn't look the best but if you, if you count how many of those were recycled balls or you know just balls trying to put the uh vacuum bank so that they couldn't be in system and run and run their uh run their system i think that that would have been higher but she was really you know this is canelia's strategy you keep the ball live give your defense a chance and you know get it gone to a good set that's that's the only goal of this offense exactly i, I thought she did a, a very good job at playing that role that she needed to play i also wanted to shout out the second setter ability of Monica De Gennaro, the libero. I was really impressed by her delivering the ball when Volish had to take the first contact. Uh, Either something close to in system with like going one foot to keep her foot behind the three meter line. And she was setting like second tempo antenna height balls with her hands and even her platform. Like in these weren't just like ceiling height, high balls, like go up and get it and try to work around the block. They were second tempo sets coming from the libero with like a decent amount of speed and very precise location. I was very impressed by that. I thought that's that a, mattered a lot. That's a good point. And you could tell they've really practiced that a lot yeah, with Igonu, exactly. with especially setting that, that uh, fast tempo ball to the to position two, like, like you mentioned. A huge yeah. asset to have a libero that can do that. We've seen that in the men's game the past five or 10 years now that like the libero has really become the second setter. Um, and well, now sometimes you see the, position six outside hitter do it to give them an option to yeah. jump and attack but um now on the women's game you're, you're starting to see that skill taught and valued in liberos that much more because that's it is really important to be able to deliver a hittable ball like to give a reasonable chance to score when the setter has to touch the first ball yeah for sure Canadiano overall just an amazing season anything else rob you want to go over before we go on to the men here no i i was just i uh I got to rub it in, Dan. I was right. I've been you were right. right. The beginning about that one. 
I know. I was thinking uh, when Vakith Bank won that, uh, won the uh, the first set. I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's uh, you know, my my team my team is gonna do it. I've been with them all season, and they're looking good. They were playing, they were playing so well, doing everything right. But then, uh, I mean, that, that Canaliano machine, Aja Volish, Paolo Iganio, that's gonna be a tough. If those two stay together, I that's 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 an incredibly tough team to beat. Not Agreed. taking anything away, thing away from the rest of them, but those two are the core, in my opinion. Yeah, totally agreed. Um, yeah, either team could have absolutely won this match. I mm -hmm. want to make that very clear. This was as, as back and forth and as close and competitive a match as it could have been. But like we've talked about all year, in a competition like this, especially when the championship is one match, it's not a series like some of them are domestically. The margin of error, the difference between a championship and disappointment, the difference between... 15 12 set five and even like i don't know vakit bank could have won that match in four they really could have and the difference between those two things is so slim and that little yeah. amount of poise of canigliano i think was a huge difference down the stretch yeah for sure but that wasn't the only amazing match of <laughs> the day we also had another fantastic one uh with sorry as i try and pull up the video here zaxa kajushin kojle versus trentino which uh, Rob, what did you think of this one? Is it, did this play out how you think we predicted or how, how you... Well, I picked Trentino, so no, it did not play out how I expected. Uh, you got me on this one, Dan, so we're, we're, we're level tied one-to-one -one on our picks. Uh, I was blown away with Zox's performance at the end of sets. Uh, they, were, they were able to get themselves... Oh, I, I like looking at the partials here. That's, that's actually really informative. Uh, Zaxa like down eight five set one, but then they turned it around. They're up twenty one nineteen towards the end. Uh, down eight six set two, again they turned it around twenty one eighteen towards the end. Uh, down eight six set three, they end up losing twenty five twenty, and then uh, set four of course was close throughout with one of the memorable championship winning points of all time that I can ever remember. Uh, but Zaxa, Zaxa just did what Zaxa does. Alexander Shlivko, a well-deserved MVP. And, and I know you really like this. I want your take on the, the two-handed attacking uh. ways that Shlivko was able to score. Some of them were absolutely ridiculous. Some of them, in my opinion, should not be legal. Uh, that might be a conversation for another time. But there was one that was definitely legal when he literally just set a ball over the net, landed right on the sideline at about, like, one meter off that scored. Like, if, he was, is he, if he's able to score like that, uh, against a, a block of Trentino's caliber, um, you just can't stop that team. I think they did. A, Zaxa did a really good job adjusting to the fact that Trentino's block actually got on them early. Uh, Trentino blocked a decent number of balls, nine stuff blocks in the match is a lot. And I made that point going in that if Trentino was able to turn the block touches that everybody usually gets against Zaxa into stuff blocks, then that would be a huge deal. And early on, actually, they did that. Uh, but Zaxa figured out a way as the match went on and as the, the set went in the late stages to use the block to their advantage. Obviously, such a huge strength of theirs. Shlifka, a huge part of that. And uh, I think we have to talk about the championship winning ace, Dan. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes, that, that, was, that was quite a moment. Uh, I have some video playing here as well for, for everyone watching, showing some uh, some. Uh, just a brief moment from from the game as well, and yeah, you made some good points. Uh, Shlifka, the MVP, but we also saw, uh, although a very even set distribution, uh, pretty uh, the most sets for Wukash Kachmerik, which was uh, a little interesting to me. We've seen a lot recently. Camille Semenyuk was uh, was the leading offensive set getter for for the team, but I don't know if, if Tony Udi or Gerbich they saw that not that he was struggling, but you know he wasn't doing a good a job scoring against this you know massive. Uh, Trentino block and maybe the Trentino team was really keen on him because they, they seem to have his number um, but then Schlifka like you said they're like okay let's go to him more and what was he 16 for 24 in the match just like 16 for 24 with three errors like come on that as, as an outside hitter in the the way that he was being used is an all-time performance like yeah. such such worthy of MVP honors and uh, doing it in all phases too like we kind of made the joke the other week that if Shlifka is your worst passer in the passing <laughs> unit, uh, you're, you're, you're set up pretty nicely. And actually it was Semenyuk with the most passing attempts by far, uh, but all of them really efficient. Um, all of them 30, at least 30% perfect, 34% perfect as a team in reception. 
but Trentino actually outpassed them. Uh, 44 percent perfect as a team Trentino was if you pass that well and you lose the match the other team's got to be doing something pretty special yeah and even though they were passing well it, it seems like they they maybe should have gone to the middles a bit more because I thought yeah. at least when I was watching the match I was like okay Pedrashen and Lisanach are on fire today like they're they're doing a great job of avoiding the blocks they, they look fresh they look like fit they look like they're doing a really good job out there but I don't know what it was, but they, they uh, whether it was a conscious decision by Gianelli or by a Lorenzetti, but I think if they could have used that a bit more, um, that, that, that could have been impressive. But of course, the team, when you build a team all year a bit around, you know, playing your opposite, maybe Luca Lucarelli to a lesser extent, really playing to the wings more so than anything, then I guess it's tough, tough to switch that at the last moment. But uh, I think there were a few sets there that went to Namir that maybe could have gone uh, in a different direction. Yeah, like looking at the middles, numbers for Trentino, Pedrashen in seven for 10, no errors. Lisa Notch, nine for 12, one error. Like yeah, 70 and exactly. 75% kills respectively is exactly what we expected out of those two middles, to be honest with you. We knew that they probably had a, a size and athleticism advantage in those areas. Uh, and I agree. I, I think if you have that advantage, why go away from it until it gets stopped? I don't think there was ever a point in the match that that got stopped uh, by Zoxa. I just think that Gianelli just started going away from him, from him for one reason or another. And uh, yeah, that was very interesting. I agree. I think they, they should have ridden that until it was stopped. And I don't think it ever would have been. Yeah. And um, guys, if you want to stick around to the end of the, the show, we have an interview I did with Ben Taniuti that I will show, showing, you know, the uh, some of the thoughts after the finals, you know, what he's been doing the past few days, and actually had a couple of interesting tidbits. Um, and I think Taniuti easily could have been MVP too. I mean, he was an absolute maestro of this game. And just it, it just goes to show, like, the value of a really precise, really good setter. And Rob, one of my one of my favorite things to do is like watch the setter during uh, like hitting lines during the warm ups. And Tony Udi, I swear, like you you could give him a pinpoint on top, like at a position on the net, and he would get there like every single time. He is unbelievably consistent, and I think that's one of the reasons why Zach's and especially Alexander Schlifka, they're able to do so well because they're able to be more creative, knowing that that set is going to be delivered in the exact same spot every time. Because I think, you know, you were talking earlier about, you know, the Schliffkas, okay, yeah, like, we're not here to debate the legality of those moves. I, I you know, I think, <laughs> I think you're, you, you, you're, it's a set, it's a, it's a legitimate volleyball play in a lot of the times. Well, the, like, the one is, but the, the, the double motion throw yeah. into the block is a different story, but yeah, we're not here to debate that. But, but yeah, I think you're, you're exactly right. The, the, the value of a setter that is that precise um, outweighs Tony Udi's disadvantage in size, in blocking ability, whatever. Uh, the value that he brings from having their offense operate just in tip-top perfect shape in any given match, including one with the stakes, is exactly why he's so valuable. Uh, I think he needs to be talked about more as one of the best pure setters in the world. I think everybody would agree that that's largely the case, but uh, needs to be ranked higher in some people's lists, in my opinion, because of what he was able to do with the Saxa team. Yeah, pure setting. I think it's I think it's him or Dicheco. I think you have to go with one of those two. Yeah. Um, but I think yeah, to do the thing that Schliffka does with the setting, you, like you need to have the ball right into the pocket uh, to be able to do that because you know you can't trick people with a with a set play if the if the ball's not exactly where you want it in front of the block. Um, we have a few comments here from people. John Sangalang. Uh, he has a question. Do you, th do you think, personally, do you like a more opposite heavy offense or one which revolves around more players? By the way, John, thanks for hanging out with us and, uh, and being in the chat here. Yeah, that's a great question, one that I wanted to get to as soon as I saw it. Um, so what I think is that it's not about how opposite dominated an offense is. I think it's like what the situation calls for to be able to score points. And it's like which which piece of your offense do you rely upon in out of system situations the the international standard at least on the men's side for years and years has now been the opposite that's the guy that you throw the ball to to just take out the trash so to speak like setter not even close to in position seven uh maybe it's a set coming from somebody else 
uh, maybe you're way off the net. Maybe you're way behind the three meter line. It's probably against three big blockers. Um, the opposite is so often called upon to score at high volume and half decent efficiency in not very good situations. That just is how the game has evolved. That's exactly what we saw on the women's side today, or not today, but uh, last weekend. And the women's side is starting to catch up to that. There's, I think right now, Dan, there's less of a difference or a like a division between men's volleyball and women's volleyball stylistically than there's ever been. I think it's becoming more and more volleyball is just volleyball and you, you score points, you terminate, you run your offense as efficiently as possible with the pieces that you have. And it doesn't really have anything to do with the, the style of that gender of volleyball anymore. It's, it's becoming more just volleyball is volleyball. And I actually love that. I think it's great because teams are pushing boundaries. They're able to be more creative. They're really finding what is best for themselves individually. And what's funny about Zaxa winning this tournament is that uh, Kachmarek, while he did get the most attempts on his team, is not traditionally going to be that guy. He's not going to be Namir. He's not going to be Maxim Mikhailov. He's not going to be Ivan Zaitsev. He's not going to be Paula Iganu or Isabel Hawk to, to get 50 attempts a game and have to score 30 points. Otherwise, you have no chance in the match. It's just not how Zaxa is built. So what they're able to do out of system doesn't rely on the opposite scoring points like that. It relies on all three of their pin attackers making good decisions, not even necessarily scoring, but making good decisions. And we've talked about it all year. So which one do I prefer personally? Um, I don't really know. I, I actually really like both of them. There, there's something about a just all world physical opposite that can score in all situations that I'll always love to watch. And then there's something about the way that Zoxa plays that I'll always love to watch too. Uh, it's fantastic. It's why... I think volleyball is so fascinating at the highest level because there's not just one way to play the game. Um, there are so many. Just based on how your team is constructed, you can choose to focus your strengths on so many different possible things and win so many ways. And why I think this Zoxta win is so great for the game of volleyball is that it proved that exact thing. Yeah, and you even see teams stylistically play a lot in the front court, maybe so, more so the Russian teams play mostly in the front. You see Italian and, and Brazilian teams play a ton a ton through the back row. You see some teams play really fast, some teams play slow. Personally, I I'm, I'm definitely would say I prefer a more balanced offense, at least to watch. You know, I, I love teams that are able to run through the middles a lot because that probably means you have a good setter <laughs> who, right. who, who, can, who can actually run the middle uh, consistently and well. Um, you know, like having the really big opposite that getting a ton of sets, you know, is great. But sometimes it, it feels like you're just giving it to your opposite because you know they can score rather than necessarily because you think it's the best decision, like you alluded to earlier. It's the decision-making factor, which I think, you know, I, I like kind of analyzing the setters, see what they're thinking, how they're breaking down the defense. And so for me, you know, watching the setter on every single play, being like, okay, where's he going to go? Where's he going to go? Whereas maybe sometimes if it's an opposite heavy offense, you're like, okay, the ball is, you know, uh, three, three meters off the net. Okay, for sure it's going to the opposite or, or to an outside hitter. For me, that's a little less interesting. Even it is really cool when, you know, Agano is just dominating, scoring 40 points, making making the block look silly. But uh, for me, I, I would prefer more spread out offense. I, I like the point you made there about having the setter really be the key, have, having them be in control and having all the, the offense really rely upon them. <clears throat> Excuse me. If, if it just gets to a point where the offense relies exclusively on the opposite, it at least is more predictable. It's sometimes really fun to watch. Like what Igonu did in those in those finals last weekend was absolutely thrilling to watch. Um, but I like I agree with you, Dan. And I love when a setter has control. I love it when they have the, the they're the smartest player on the floor. When they're thinking steps ahead of the other team. When they're really understanding all the moving parts on the court. Uh, like the chess master sort of thing. Like we see Maruf do that for Iran on the national team stage. We see Tony Udi do that all the time. We can tell there's a sense of thoughtfulness and a, and a real, like a real sense of understanding and uh, like a, a confidence in the way he makes decisions that I am always just obsessed with watching setters at that high of a level do their thing. So I agree with you in that sense. Okay, Rob, let's get to a couple questions in the chat because you guys are starting to pick it up. I love it. All we always love when you guys ask questions. And also, if you haven't uh, liked the video that please do. And uh, especially if you're enjoying this conversation, breaking down the super finals. But Georgie, 
ask Rob, how much, how much do you love the way Schlifka is dealing with blocks? Uh, I think his vision is off the charts. I think his vision and decision-making are absolutely stellar. Uh, they're unbelievable the way that he is able to take a very good block in front of him, understand the situation. And even if it's not score points right away, he's making the right decision all the time. Sometimes uh, the ends don't necessarily justify the means, in my opinion. I yeah. hate the two-handed throw into the block. I hate it. I absolutely hate it. I don't think it should be legal, but that's a conversation for another time. Uh, but the creativity in, in offense is something that I really like. Uh, I just don't like if you can catch and throw it very much. It's kind of like in the beach how you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to open hand tip, but if you, uh, if you tip it into the block you are, it's kind of like a weird... Uh a weird quirk of the rules, which, which kind of makes sense if you, if you read about it, but then you see it in practice, you're like, oh yeah, no, that, that, that's actually really weird. Um, here's another one. Uh, I think someone discussing earlier, sorry guys, I forget exactly who it was, but someone said uh, they would have, Trentino would have won if Micheletto had started the match. And So I was shocked that he didn't. Yeah, I was sure. shocked too, yeah. But Dick Coy, at least offensively, played perfectly fine. I think, yeah, five for eight with one error. That's fine. That That is not by any means the reason why they lost the match. Yeah, no, exactly. I, I don't think that was the – you know, I agreed when they switched him in. That was probably the right decision. But, like, what could what could have Micheletto done really to uh, to really improve the performance – of of Trentino to make like up that three point gap. I, right, that's not his role. That's that's just not his role to like close the gap like that. He's there to do everything well to not not be able to be picked on in any area. Uh, but he's not like Namir is the guy on the opposite end of the spectrum of that. Where if you need to close a gap, you send him back to the service line and you set him every ball in transition. And if he gets hot, then there's your answer. It is very different from. Micheletto and how he serves the team in that sense. And by the way, I was incredibly impressed by Micheletto uh, watching oh, him yeah. in person this weekend. Uh, I, I I think it doesn't come across as much on TV just how tall he is. He really <laughs> is like like significantly taller than the middle blockers Lizanach and Pedrashin, who are also huge. Uh, so I really, think this he's is, like he's legitimately bigger than Lizanach for sure. And That's outrageous. I know. Uh, or maybe oh, he got man. taller since the start of the season. It's it's pretty crazy to see. And, you know, I think this is like the last major club game that he'll ever like start on the bench because I think he's he's uh, he's going to be one of the most valuable players in Italy, like starting maybe next year, but definitely the year after as he gains that confidence, gains, you know, yeah. a, bit of, a bit of strength in his legs, gains a little more athleticism, uh, learns to, how to deal with some of the blocks because, you know, a lot of the most important tools are already there. Yeah, great point. I mean, he's only 19 and his stock rising maybe is quickly as anybody in the volleyball world right now yeah so and, before we move on i i have to talk about the kachmarik ace to win the match okay sorry i kind of yeah you talked about it earlier and then i kind of switched topics but let's talk about it uh first of all the serve itself was absolutely amazing it was it was hit hard with pace exactly perfectly in the seam between two passers uh nothing they they really could have done even if one of them had made a very strong move it would have been difficult to keep that ball alive uh the moment obviously was huge and so, I, like I said, I had people over here in Chicago to watch the match. And uh, one of my buddies said, like, at what was it, 27, 26, when Kochmark was back there, he just said, this is an ace, the game's over. Yeah. <laughs> and not, not even necessarily because he, like, knew or just or had any, like, statistics or, like, education, ed educated opinion to back that up. He's just like, yep, this is an ace. And I said, like, well, he did win a golden set earlier this tournament on an ace, and not half a second later, he serves an ace and wins the tournament. So uh, yep. that was amazing. We all absolutely lost our minds here in my apartment watching that. It was oh, just incredible, incredible. I mean, I don't typically think of Lukas Kaczmarek as like this like ace, amazing, like guaranteed server. But I mean, he's, it's happened enough times now. I don't know what it is, but uh, this is definitely a storyline of, of Kaczmarek being like the most clutch server in volleyball because... <laughs> Taking out Trentino and Lube in Champions League with an ace is like, I don't think, like, probably no one has done it. Except right. For that, I, I wish we could, like, break down the, like, ridiculously detailed, like, baseball style stats the, the way that they do to, to find that information. But, like, yeah. to, to do what Zoxa did, to beat the three teams that they did in the Champions League playoffs 
and to do it the way that they did it. Uh, two golden sets and then an extra points a serve in set four of the super finals will be talked about for forever and ever. Just an unbelievable storybook performance for Zaxa. Just just incredible. Yeah, one, one of the most legendary Champions League runs of all time, and especially because Luve and Zenit Kazan were, first of all, the two finalists, both the previous editions. Right. And also the two winners, the previous editions. And Zenit Kazan obviously had won however many they won before that. Rob, I, 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 and I love Zax and I'm so proud of them and I'm so happy that Poland... Uh, they're so deserving to have a club as a Champions League champions. But, I mean, it, it, it does a little bit hurt that they lost in the Polish League finals because if they, if they had had that, this would have been, you know, Kneliano and Zaxa probably would have both had, like, two of the best club seasons of all time. Of all time. Yeah, I agree. It, it, especially for, like, the Plus Liga's reputation and legitimate le- legitimacy i think it it already makes a huge difference that a polish team won champions league but i I agree it would have been nice it really would have just like cemented this zaxa season as one of the best of all time if they were able to get that done domestically but i I don't think it takes that much away from this achievement especially the teams that they were able to go through the the draw that they got like we freaked out when we saw this draw (laughs) like you were saying that you guys in the office when you saw that draw for zaxa your jaws were on the floor them getting lube and then probably zen kazan to survive those and then to win the super finals is is an all-time, an all-time Champions League run. Will be talked about for eternity. Yeah, and I think if if people are gonna take away, clubs are gonna take away one thing from the season, I hope it's that more teams kind of do it the Zach Sekajush and Kojle way. Because you know, they kept this team around for a couple of years. They've had Satorsky and Tony Udi for five plus years, which is extremely rare in volleyball to have, you know, players around that long. They're, they're a little shorter. They defend really well, as, as someone pointed out in the chat. They're inc- uh, yeah, Mar- Maria, Maria, sorry, uh, in the chat, yeah, pointed out they're incredibly fun to watch on defense because, I mean, Zatorski, Semenyuk, and Schlifka, and even, even David Smith had a couple of digs in there. But uh, David he- Smith was my X Factor in this match, by ah, the way. Ah, okay. I, uh, I give him a ton of credit. I'm very excited for another American to win Champions League. But they're fun. They're relaxed. They play, like, Every single way on the court, they're, they're not afraid to mix it up in the attacking. They're creative. You know, I, I thought it was an extremely fun vo- way of volleyball to watch uh, this year. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad they won. And I hope more teams are, are able to think outside the box a little bit. You know, step away from maybe the, the rigid traditional ways of playing men's volleyball and, and have a little more fun with it. That's a fantastic point, Dan, and something that I'll get to a little bit like next in our debate segment, but the, the the point about Zaxa being together as a team for quite a few years is incredibly rare in club volleyball, like you said. Uh, the, the transfers that we all get excited to talk about every year about who's moving where uh, are fascinating, but it, it, it there is something to be said for keeping a team across several years. And, and then that combined with the creative and different style of play that Zaxa utilized all year long and what they were able to achieve i think is great for the game of volleyball i do hope that other clubs in all sorts of countries in europe and around the world take notes from that they are more willing to think long term they're not necessarily approaching every off season with just a one year mindset Uh, i hope that they're starting to think in longer terms and building a system club-wise that's going to contend for championships over a longer period of time. Uh, I think that's incredibly valuable for the game at large. I think it's great for the game that Zaxa won this tournament doing it the way they did. I think you absolutely nailed it. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so let's uh, move on to the debate then, Rob. I think it's a kind of interesting one here today. Uh, Kind of of related to our... uh, to our topic of the day, the Super Finals. You know, this is probably the last we're going to talk about club volleyball for a little while, unfortunately. But uh, if you guys have not watched the debate before, me and Rob are going to argue two different sides of the same argument. Our today's topic: Could a Super Finals team win the Olympics? Uh, if you guys agree with myself, Dan, put those wave emojis in the chat. And if you think Rob is winning the arguments, get those spicy red pepper emojis in the chat. Whoever has the most emojis wins the debate. Uh, I believe I went first last time, Rob. So I think uh, I think you're up. Okay. Uh, first of all, this is a great debate segment because it's a nice way to kind of bridge the transition between club and national team season. 
because you're right, this is sort of the last we'll talk about the club for a little while. Um, it is officially national team season. Uh, European, like Euro Volley qualifiers are happening. Uh, VNL is happening very soon and Tokyo Olympics is this year. So this is a nice debate to usher in the national team season, which I'm very excited about. We haven't had in a few years. So the question, could a super finals team win the Olympics? Let's take this year, for example. Uh, could this Zaksa Kedrzej and Kojle team win the Olympics? Maybe. They absolutely have the talent level. Um, the, now, the difference is, in my opinion, the Olympics is a competition that national teams plan for for at least the entire four-year cycle. Everything related to the Olympics or related to all national team competition revolves in a four-year cycle that we commonly call a quad. It starts like in the summer after the Olympics and it culminates with the Olympics. Every national team completely gears all of their fine-tuned little decisions around what is going to be best for the program at the Olympics every four years. And like we just talked about with club in general, other than like loosely what Zox has been doing the last couple of years, that's not the case. They are trying to, to spend money to build rosters to compete in one year. And then there's a chance that none of those players will be there again the following year. Uh, no team, no team that is built that way could possibly get away with that in the Olympics, in my opinion. Uh, money can buy players. Uh, it can buy talent. But what it can't buy is four years worth of chemistry and work put in behind the scenes. And then when you add in like the pride of nationalism and the prestige of the Olympics, no offense, Dan, working for the CEV, but oh, the Olympics is the number one thing you can achieve in, as a volleyball player. Uh, it, it's it's higher than winning Champions League. It's higher even than I think winning world championships. Uh, the Olympics is it. That's it. If you if you wear an Olympic gold medal around your neck, that is the ultimate thing that you can accomplish in the game of volleyball. That team achievement um, is it, just it's it's what it's what you dream about as representing your country on that stage. That there is a difference in that. And the average like super final champion club team doesn't quite have that. I, I think the the motivation for playing club is different than the motivation for playing your national team. The bulk of a, a professional volleyball player's livelihood, their salary comes from their club team, not the national team. Uh, people play for the national team because they want to, because they're passionate about representing their country and winning the ultimate prize of those giant international tournaments. And that, like, that combined with the fact that everything is worked on, is built so slowly and in such detail over four year periods, and in this case, five years, um, I don't think a, a, a club team at any level, even though you can buy all the talent in the world, I don't think that you can construct a team over four years uh, to compete at the Olympics the way that national teams can, especially because also in the Olympics, the diversity of styles of play is so much more wide. Uh, we, we talked about Zox's diversity of style of play. They're different from the average club team they play differently but national teams have styles that go from when kids are growing up first playing the game at age eight or nine or whatever that countries have their identities their play styles that permeate everything from top to bottom within their borders domestically the way they play volleyball it makes all the difference in the world and you can pinpoint team styles of plays based on who they are as a national team that's just not quite true in the club sense and there's so many more ways to play the game. I'm not sure a club team that could at any point come in and win at the Olympic level in that way. Now, if we talked about it the other way around, I also don't necessarily think a national team could win Champions League. I think it's a very different format. Uh, but for the sakes of this argument, I don't think a, a, a club team, no matter how you constructed it, could medal. They definitely couldn't win. And I don't even think they could medal at the Olympics. Oh, wow. not even a medal, but Rob, excellent points as usual. Guys, remember, if you, uh, if you think Rob is, is throwing the heat in this debate, put a spicy pepper in the chat. And Rob, I have three main arguments I'm going to make in favor of a Super Finals club level team uh, being able to not only medal, but win the Olympics. The first is that on these top level club teams, you are basically picking the players you want to construct a roster that fits together perfectly. And as you know, fit is often just as big of a factor in volleyball 
as the actual talent level of the player, the way they work together, the setter, how they work with the middles, everyone, every, it's, it's such a team sport. Everyone needs to be working together on the national team. Uh, you don't get to pick, you, you get to pick your players, but among a much, much smaller pool. So you have guys, you know, that might not fit the team, not be playing to the best of their capability. You can't choose. You just have to basically roll with what you're given. And, and yes, you have a long time to develop that, but at the same time, Players are limited to a certain extent. Like you can coach them all you want. Some players are not going to be good receivers. You can coach all you want. Some players are not going to be able to have a strong spin serve. So to be able to pick and choose what skills you want, uh, I think is incredibly valuable. And the second point is that I think uh, club teams do play together a lot. And I think that constant level of you know, micro adjustment that you do over the course of the season is, is almost even more valuable than spending you know, those summers together because you are working every single day, every single week, constantly making little adjustments, constantly communicating, learning each other's tendencies. You're doing all this you know, slowly, not all at once. So you forget it every summer. You do it uh, very slowly over the course of the season. So you're peaking right at the end of the season. And my third point is that you know, club teams, obviously, just you, know, you can have players from different countries all playing together. And you know, some players that aren't necessarily part of the elite Olympic uh, family, that's, you know, the Russias, the Italys, the Brazils, the USAs that tend to dominate at the Olympics. You have players from Canada, players from Cuba, players from France, players from uh, wherever. You can have all these players available to you. And I think that's a much bigger talent pool uh, in the club volleyball world compared to the Olympics. Yes, some of the Olympic teams probably would be way too expensive <laughs> to, to fit together all on the same club team, especially the ones that are likely to medal. But if you combine uh, that fact with the fact that uh, you're able to pick and choose the skills you want, I think if you had a good coach who knew what they were doing and a good manager picking the right roster, I think it could happen. Good point. I, I would like to see the club game go more that way and that, that that would be the mindset with which club teams were constructed. I think that would be awesome. And I think Sox and winning Champions League, it might push the game in that direction. I think that's awesome. Okay, Maria, actually, uh, yeah, guys, remember to put your emojis in the chat here if you, uh, if you think one of us will let it go for a, a couple more minutes. Um, but Maria has another good point. She says that it's, Amoko could have a pretty good chance of winning the Olympics, but Zaxa, um, not as much of a chance. What do you think about that? She might be right. Uh, yeah. she, so she made the point about the the tournament format, and I agree. Uh, club teams, the, the, just the 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 rhythm of your schedule on a club team is incredibly different from a tournament like the Olympics. I think that would be an adjustment. Um, but like Conigliano, uh, of, of all the club teams that have ever existed, uh, that one might might just be able to win the Olympics. Like I might have to agree with her there. Yeah. Also, guys. Uh, I, see, I see a few votes, people voting for both sides, and well, we, we love the support. Uh, try and pick one because it's, it's hard to keep track. I think uh, Kelsey and Edmondo <laughs> both voted for both. Um, but it looks like, I don't know, Rob, I think I see more waves just from my, from my eye test uh, in the chat. I think uh, maybe people are voting more than once. I don't know. We can count it again. But uh, yeah, I, think, I, th I do think the, high highest, the absolute highest level club teams are, are pretty much comparable. With, uh, with the Olympic teams, but I think you made some very good points as well on you know, why, it's just the difference in, in intensity and in vibe between national team and yeah. club. It's different, like normalizing the levels between the two is difficult to do, which is why it's fun to debate it. But the, what's, what's not debatable is that it's different. Uh, yeah. It's super duper different. And I, I don't know about you, Dan, but I am so excited that national team season is back. Yeah, and for those of you guys who missed the beginning of the podcast, Eurovolley qualifier is happening right here on YouTube and also on Eurovolley.tv. Uh, there's Croatian Netherlands happening right after this show, so check that out if you're if you can't contain your excitement for national team season. Um, you guys, we'll give you a couple more minutes to uh, to ask a couple questions uh, before we go into an interview I did earlier this week. Sorry, guys, it's not live. Earlier this week with Ben Taniuti, where he goes over. Uh, some information from the super finals and uh, you know, it gives a little tidbits into the finals against Poland and, and how maybe it even motivated them more at the super finals. Um, Rob, do you see any questions in the chat here you want to address or? Uh, not really. I think we should jump to Tony Udi. I'm really excited to hear from him. All right. So guys, 
thank you for watching, tuning in to this Super Finals recap episode. And uh, let's get on to the interview with Ben Taniuti, which... Sorry. Uh, one second, guys. Oh, I found the right one. Here. All right. Hi, everyone. We are here with Benjamin Taniuti, the uh, French setter who recently took Zach Sekajuj and Kojle to the promised land, the Champions League victory. Ben, how are you doing today? Uh, perfect. Everything is okay. Uh, get some rest. And uh, then I will go to the dinner with the guys. We need uh, to meet each other because uh, soon uh, everybody will go uh, to his house. So, so it's nice to, to see each other again. So take me through the last uh, couple of days here. You guys obviously had the big victory Saturday night. Uh, I think travel on Sunday. And then what have you been up to the last uh, few hours? Yeah. So, yeah, we have a late game. So the night was really small. We, we, uh, we make good, uh, good party after the game. Uh, so we just enjoy uh, to be together to win the, this trophy for the club, uh, for fans. And, uh, and yes, after we arrive in Kijerzyn, we have some uh, uh, fans who are waiting us in the, in the front of the hall. And, uh, and then we have some, uh, some dinner with sponsor. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, the last things with, uh, with uh, our sponsor, with fans also. Uh, so, yeah, it's like three days of uh, celebration, we can say. <laughs> awesome, awesome. And, and how has the response from the fans and the media and sponsors been so far? Uh, I think like uh, it's like a dream for for everybody because uh, not a lot of people was uh, expect that we we were able to to win the Champions League. We know that we have a really good team. Uh, I think the fact that we win against Lube and Kazan give us a lot of confidence, and uh, we just make the the history of uh, of Poland of uh, of this club of uh, of Polish volleyball. So. Uh, it's an amazing feeling for everybody, and uh, everybody is uh, just super happy about uh, what we what we do. Yes, the first uh, European Polish champion since 1978, as uh, Alexander Sivka said in his post game interview, which is an incredible accomplishment. So, can we talk a little bit about the journey of of how you got here? Because for me, it's like almost out of a uh, a storybook or a fairy tale. It, it's just an amazing journey uh, playing Lube Chivatanova then Zenit Kazan, then Trentino all in a row in the Champions League. So uh, maybe talk a little bit about that first matchup with Lube Chivitanova. Mm, yeah, when you see our, uh, the way how we, we go to the final and how we, we win the trophy, we can say that uh, we deserve it because we have the worst maybe draw that we can have to finish first <laughs> of, the, of the group and take Lube. It was the worst draw, and uh, to I think the first game, maybe Lube was not expecting that we would play good like uh, like we play, and we we take this first game three one, and then you know when you first, when you win the first game three one, you know that at least even if you lose three one or three zero at home, you will have the golden set at home. So we play a good game even if we lose three zero. Uh, and we won the golden set. So this was the first step. I think we we created this uh, this uh, qualification for semi final in the first game in in uh, in Chivitanova. So was there any what 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 was the feeling after the in the second match after you had lost the I guess the original match three nothing? Was there anything you said to the team in timeouts or anything Coach Gerbich said to the team that motivated you guys to come back and take take that golden set? I think it was not even motivated us because uh, we were playing good. We were playing super game. Like in the first one, we just missed some occasion and, uh, and Civitanova was most focused. They were most focused in the second game. They serve really strong. So they make some breakpoint in the important moment in the first three sets. And uh, we just stay in the game in the tie break. And then uh, we didn't make some aces in the first three set. And in the gold set, we make two or three really important aces. Uh, I'm thinking about this one to finish the game of uh, Lukas Kishmarek. So, you know, it's like uh, some detail. Yeah, getting an ace on uh, Osmani Wantarena to uh, make the Champions League semifinals, that was a pretty uh, special moment. 
but that wasn't the end of it. That was, <clears throat> sorry. That wasn't the end of it. You guys uh, played your national team teammate, Irvin Engapet, and the rest of Zenit Kazan, who, as, as everyone knows, listening to this, the most uh, was, story team in Champions League, right? <laughs> so yeah, that yeah, must yeah, have been a yeah. bit uh, intimidating to uh, to play them. Yeah, yeah, it was a uh, it was tough uh, tough game. Also, I was super happy to to play against Erwin because he's one one of my uh, best friends. We played so much uh, game together, and uh, it was a long time we don't play against each other. So it was nice to see him. Uh, we speak a lot before the game and. We were saying that at least one French guy will be in the final. Doesn't matter who, but one guy will be in the final. So we are laughing about this, and uh, and it was also a really tough, uh, tough semi-final. You you see, it was three two in Kazan, three two uh, in Kajerjin, then Golden Set. So so it was super exciting game, like so stressful, and in the end we managed to to win also this uh, this Golden Set. Uh, just do you happen to know when the last uh, French player to win Champions League is or who they are? I guess I guess yeah. two players won Champions League because there's a uh, Jaquille right uh, on on Corneliano. Uh, yes, uh, Lucie Jaquiel win the Champions League yeah with Corneliano. And uh, I think the last man who win Champions League was Bruno Erp with yeah. Trentino. And he was like he was the third outside hitter. Uh, so he was the last French guy who in Champions League. Uh, so it's been a little while. Congratulations. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there was one moment in particular that I just want to touch on briefly in that uh, semifinals match because there were a bunch of uh, match points um, in that second match and one really nice block by Kohanovsky to, uh, if you remember that moment uh, where they, I think it was a middle, middle set to Artem Volvich and Kohanovsky blocked it. That seemed to turn the, the game, game around. Different yeah, guys, sorry, the game. first match, right? Sorry. Yeah, the first match, we were like, we were not playing perfect the first two sets. I think like, uh, okay, they play really good. And these points make, uh, change the game, I think, because uh, then they start to, to be more nervous. And uh, we just take our chains. Uh, they have, yeah, they have two match ball, I even more. I don't know how many match ball they have. But one with free ball. So this block of uh, of Kuba Koranovsky was really important. And uh, and then we start to play better after the, the victory of the third set. Yeah, it really seemed to turn the turn the match around. And then um let's move on more to the Verona super finals. And I was there with you guys. Um and the I, I felt the the energy on the team. You guys seemed to be the most relaxed team out of out of all four teams there. Uh, do you think that's true, or, or do you think that was um, that was the vibe on the team, or or, or how do you? Uh, I do you don't know exactly that? because I don't know how they were feeling the other teams. So, but we have some couple of day after our final of the league uh, that it was difficult to manage because we don't exp- like okay we we lose this final against Yashembe and it was tough for us because we dominate all the season. So we have a hard moment uh, after this final, but we come back to. To practice really good, uh, we were really ready to to play this final. We we are focused, and I think the atmosphere in the team is like this all the year. So it's not like we were like not stressed or something like this. It's just the the atmosphere in the team is good. And do you think that loss in, in the finals against Yastrzemski? Do you think that um, helped the team, or do you think you like kind of motivated you guys a little bit more in the finals, or do you think it 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 wouldn't have affected uh, anything. We were thinking about this after the final. That if we win the if we win the championship, if I don't know if we win the championship final. So this is the question, and I cannot answer you for sure. It was really a tough moment after losing the final of uh, of, uh, of the league. So we come back to practice really strong. So this is a fact that uh, permits us to to perform in in Verona. Yeah. And maybe just going back to, you said you dominated the regular season in, in the Plus Liga, which is the Polish league, for those of you who don't know. 23-3, and three, an incredible record. What was, it, what was it like day-to-day for your team? Because you guys pretty much had the same lineup for a lot of those games, uh, the same starting seven. Was it, was it tiring over time? Like, how did you guys keep on, on winning those games? 
Mm, I think the preparation was important because we arrived together in the middle of July and we worked so hard, so difficult. It was tough preparation for me. It was it was the first preparation almost because I have no summer with national team with COVID, so it was really, really tough, really difficult. Uh, yeah. For this moment, I hate the pre the physical preparator. For uh, two <laughs> two months, I I hate him. So it was really tough. But in the end, you see that the the work was good because we we like you say we we have we don't change a lot of players and we keep the same level. Only yeah, we lose uh, in the final. Uh, the fact that Zatorski was injured in the um, in one moment of semi final was uh, uh, was tough for us. But uh, okay, come back for the Champions League and help us to, to win this trophy. And speaking of Pavel, you guys have been playing together on uh, Kajush and Kojle for, for a number of years now. Is it, is it six years together? Six seasons? Uh, yeah, six years for me and seven for him. Oh, wow. Okay. So is there any extra special elements uh, for you two guys who have been with the team for so long to this Champions League victory? Um, for sure, we... When I arrived in Kijerjin, um I was like, I don't know how many times I will stay and how I will feel, how I, what I will win. But I, it's like a process. We start to win the first season and we, we just change some players and we stay with Zati and we continue to win. And we see that uh, step by step, we were like doing good in Champions League. We go one time to the final four of, uh, of Champions League in Kazan two years ago. Uh, last year we lose in quarterfinal against Kemerovo. We were every time there to be in the end of the Champions League. So I think it was a it was a goal for us to to win the Champions League uh, with Zaxel. Yes, and you guys finally got there after, like you said, many many <laughs> you know many uh, swings at the bat, and you and you guys uh, finally accomplished it. Now now that the game's over, can you maybe give us a little bit of a strategic insight of how you guys prepared for that last match? Um, well, I think uh, during this time of preparation, we work really strong on the what we don't do really good in the final of uh, of Plus Liga. We were focused on of what we were doing good during the season and what uh, we missed a little bit during the the final. So we work really strong on our uh, points, and also we yeah we prepare pretty good the game. They were making like crazy a lot of video the coaches. And uh, we were ready to to play against against Trento. We know that it, it was a team uh, really powerful in service, who have um, like big player in every position. So we expect that the the game will be really tough. Yeah, especially uh, when you're going up against those two middle uh, middle attackers in Pedrashin and Lizanach. They uh, they certainly had, had a really good game. But you guys did a great job of limiting, limiting their attackers. I thought the reception was amazing in the game. And uh, all three wing hitters and all both your middle attackers and, and yourself as well played a fantastic match. So Ben, to end here, uh, what are, do you have a little bit of a break before the national team season starts? Um, are you excited for the Olympics? What's next for you? Yeah, now I will come back to France soon uh, because like I say, I arrived 13th of July and uh, the season was super long. I have no occasion to come back to France because of COVID, because of uh, uh, a game that we have to play like uh, around Christmas. So I have no time to come back to France. So now is the moment to to come back to see a little bit my family, my friends. Um, so I will spend like uh, like almost two weeks uh, at home. And uh, then I will go with national team to, to, to the Vienna bubble um, and then to Olympics. So yeah, I'm really exciting. Now I need some rest and uh, yeah. I will be really focused in two weeks for the summer. <laughs> All right. Well, Ben, enjoy these two weeks of rest. You uh, definitely deserve it. Well done with the Champions League victory and all the best for the summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.